we would divide the day up uh, in high schools into bits of time, you know, into 40 or 50 minute blocks typically, and then we'd ring bells and people start to shuffle around the room and do something else. That's a organizational device, it's not an educational principle. Penn University of Heads in 1890 said, in 11th grade, everyone should learn chemistry, and senior year, everyone should learn physics. A lot of these subjects are great, but these priorities were, were dictated 124 years ago. Old blue collar industrial model of education is already gone. We're already living in its wake. What happens to society when hundreds of millions of people have that aimless running of steel right now? I've been replaced by a very small box. I don't know if there's a solution. We all learn in different ways. This isn't the way to do it. This is the way that I do it. If the assignment is you get it back and you crumple it up and throw it in the trash can, that's kind of one student experience. And if the assignment is to produce something that you're going to present to professionals in the field, that's completely changing the, the whole dynamic. We are trying to have that type of perplexity and curiosity get inculcated in our students. Saying your parents, all your friends' parents, and a bunch of people you don't know are going to be here to see the work you did. It creates a an aspect of authenticity because we are creating something for an audience. The things I think in life that give us some of the greatest satisfaction is making something that wasn't there before. And I can't wait for that moment when it does work, and I'm completely done with it. And it's like always. Yeah, it the kids have that feeling it's transformative for them. I need this, and everyone's coming to look at it. How many of you have actually seen Most Likely to Succeed? Awesome. Lots of hands. So, my name is Josh Rapoon. You're here in this session because Kelsey, Matsu, and I made a documentary together called Kahalanaau, The Learning Walk. So here's the quick uh, story about how our documentary film got made. Most likely to succeed showed up in my life. Um, I was a teacher for 17 years in independent schools. Um, and I now work for Apple. And no, this is not a growth in my ear. This is the new AirPod. Um, and no, you can't get them because we don't have them in stock, sorry. Um, so, most likely showed up in my life um, a year and a half ago because of some friends at the Punahou Lab School. Um, they alerted me to the film. I saw the trailer. I was very intrigued, um, was able to see the film, and um, immediately knew that this was a film that was speaking to my heart and my head and to everything that I had believed education um, needed to become uh, for the 21st century. And it also spoke to who I was as a teacher for all those years that I was teaching. So I did a community screening in Kaka'ako with some partners, um, and that was uh, last October, October of, this is 2017, that's October of 2015. Um, and then my brother John, who's the executive director of Key Project in Kahalu, invited me to do a screening at Key Project um, in January, and we executed a really big 175 person screening of most likely, and we broke everybody up into small um, groups. There are 25 tables of about seven or eight people, and we had an amazing discussion after that film. Uh, people were still talking about it long after the film was over. Uh, they wouldn't leave, and they wouldn't let me interrupt them as we were doing the discussion. Um, at the same time that I was preparing for that screening, out of the blue, frankly, um, the executive producer of Most Likely to Succeed contacted me and asked me to organize the last stop on his 50-state year-long tour, and that last stop was Hawaii. So um, he came in May, in, uh, it was May 8th through the 13th of uh, 2016, and um, together with many, many partners, uh, we put together an itinerary that almost killed the poor guy. Um, we had him going from uh, 7 in the morning until 10 o'clock at night pretty much every day for the five days. He began his stay in Hawaii, his learning walk in Hawaii, with the governor and his wife at Washington Place, a 90-minute conversation 
um, that I think really set the tone for the entire week. And um, we took him on a series of learning walks through public, private, and charter schools and community organizations. Um, in the process of um, doing the key project screening, um, I met with Kelsey and together we partnered up to make a short eight minute film about that key project screening in January. And in the process of getting ready for Ted to come in May, which was about four months worth of work, um, I was literally swimming laps up below the pool one day and it popped into my head that it would be really awesome to have a documentary filmmaker surround this documentary filmmaker and make a documentary film. <laughs> and so Kelsey agreed. Uh, we raised the money together. Um, the, our, our sponsors, the Education Institute of Hawaii, the Hawaii Association of Independent Schools, the Public Schools of Hawaii Foundation, the Island Insurance uh, Foundation, um, and the Hawaiian Electric Company, Alan Oshima, thank you to all of them for helping fund our 30 minute documentary film. So we surrounded Ted with cameras the entire learning walk while he was here, and Kelsey took 400 gigs of film um, including some drone footage, which was the first time we did anything like that. And um, she teased out of those 400 gigs a 30-minute documentary that we called Couple and How, The Learning Walk. And so I would like to just show you the film, and then afterwards we'll have a little bit of time uh, to have a conversation about the film and what it, what it means um, to us as a state and where we go forward from here. Education has to change. Education was designed for a diff very different time, but our system of education has, has kind of lagged behind how society is today, where it's all around teams and collaboration and being able to interact with people and getting along with people. How do I teach students to want to make changes in our community and be community contributors? And, um, and also, like, how do you really teach uh, love of learning? In 2015, Ted Winter Smith produced Most Likely to Succeed, a documentary about the need to rethink education for the purposes of our current world. The film was screened in communities across all 50 states, including here in Hawaii, where it has brought together community members from all industries and sectors to reimagine education for our students. The movie itself is a, is a really interesting entry into a dialogue that I think many communities need to have. I love how um, the movie brings together a lot of different people, from the department to the community to higher education to families to parents to kids. At all the screenings I attended, we had a really neat mix of people. And the conversations that happened after about transformative education with people across industry was uh, an amazing opportunity. Ted followed up his documentary with a tour of schools across the nation. He ended his nearly year-long tour in Hawaii, where he visited private, public, and charter schools, propelling the conversation about rethinking education even further. I think when Ted visited, he got conversations going amongst different people, different institutions, and highlighted the good things that were happening in Hawaii. To have someone like Ted Dinter Smith, a, a national, even international figure, come and be amazed at all of the things that we're doing. I think it's really important for um, the people of Hawaii to recognize that they're really at the forefront of education. I just stand in, in awe, right, of the people here who, who have been working so hard in such a dedicated way to bring their schools forward. And, and they are fighting, I think, not just for a few schools. They're fighting for schools across the state. And, and I think we all our uniforms and we, we can't just have some great schools. We need to have all of our schools be, be helping prepare kids for life. The ability for Ted to walk around campus and, and sort of engage on a learning walk with us was really very affirming for us because in the end um, he was able to see our progression. We are by no means uh, complete in our, our journey from a traditional school to a very deeper learning project-based school, but we are on a very good trajectory. With his extensive experience and his uh, travels around the United States, 
that breadth of experience and that, that viewpoint really helps inform what we're doing. And what we heard was you're doing a great job of being creative, of allowing kids to be innovative. You're letting them uh, sort of find their own path, but you're doing it in a way that is also uh, very supportive. Every single one of us finds something that we are passionate about to change. What we worked on is that we did a bucket garden. The whole premise of it is that you take trash, so plastic buckets that are used by um, restaurants that they get their food in, they're food safe, so that yeah. toxic materials won't go into yeah. the dirt and poison your food that you want to grow in it. And so we actually have one just outside of our classroom. We built it ourselves, we went out, bought the materials, we researched everything, found out how many pounds of methane goes into the atmosphere from this trash that we just leave sitting in yeah. landfills when you could use it for something better. Yeah. You could use it to grow your own food, which like we need because living in Hawaii especially, a lot of our stuff is imported and we don't have a lot of yeah. food reliance and food sustainability. What I saw today where kids are working on things and they can see a tangible connection to their community and making things better. And, and what are we reinforcing there? We're reinforcing that all of our kids can find ways to make the world better in ways that leverage what they care about and their growing sense of skills and character traits that say what really matters is, you know, working collaboratively with others to make the world better. It's a good feeling to risk as a school in a slightly um, non-traditional way and find out that it was the right risk at the right time because it was about kids who really want this kind of learning. Well, we're doing an end of the year project right now. So we're focusing on UN 2030 goals. We picked um, the Syrian civil war and how the Syrian refugees got affected and yeah. their, like, their timeline. We really wanted to work on like raising awareness to people and educating them because this topic is kind of hard to like solve like at once. So we came up with this um, product. Our main product is a bracelet, like a beaded bracelet. And on half of it is like green or red. So we're incorporating like the Syrian colors from yeah. the Syrian flag. And so like for one bracelet, it's like light green on one side. And that represents the Syrians, the Syrian refugees life before the Syrian civil war hit. So we think it's all light and like happy and colorful. But like on the other side, it starts getting darker and darker and darker, darker until it reaches like one bead, which is like black. And that represents like how it, like the war can like like creep up on you and like make your whole life shatter in darkness. As the adults step into the background, which is the best part ever, when you see that happen and the kids flourish, well, then you've done your job. Today, you want a kid to be great at finding and accessing sources of information, synthesizing, vetting, deciding what makes sense and is accurate and what isn't. Those are the things you want a kid to get good at. Think of what a textbook does. It erases all of those opportunities to develop skills of that. More and more, what you need are self-starters. You need kids who are self, you know, really driven, can manage themselves independently without other people um, needing to tell them what to do. To me, the, the, the question becomes, how do you create an environment where students um, become students for life? Right? So how, do you, how do you teach a way of thinking and create the love of learning, that is like the ultimate gift you can impart to someone as a teacher or to a, as a mentor is they love, you know, this whole idea of learning that the next exciting thing is the next thing I'm going to learn. Not the thing that all the stuff I learned in the past, but the thing I'm going to go forward with, right? And, and that's the kind of people we need, I think, um, for, for our business. And so that's why we're so, you know, so involved with education is because whatever happens in education, we're gonna see coming to our workforce in the next five, 10, 20 years. Besides just doing kind of, kind of a big thing, what do you get? Well, we took that with Enabling the Future too. Yeah. Um, they basically give us clients, usually younger, like five-ish, where um, normally if they got a prosthetic that's really expensive, they grow out of it in like a year, so it's not really worth it for them to get on. So we give them free prosthetics that um, hook up to their wrists and then their palms, and when they bend their wrist, their fingers on the hand close and they can pick someone up and like right back. It's kind of cool. At the beginning of the year, yeah, you take um, a project that you want and you have to propose it in front of the entire school, and then they'll say yes or no to it. There are dwarf seahorses. You guys saw them? Oh, you aren't? They're like the coolest. Next year is when we're going to start our actual science with them. So we're going to be doing 
birthing, like testing birthing methods, methods, and then food preferences. Oh, the babies are actually yeah. in here. You have to look really tiny. Seriously? Yeah. yeah. Right? They're really small. We try, you know, looking at the real world. You know, be successful. Use your time wisely. How to multitask. They learn all kinds of things like that. Oral communication. Yeah. You know, things that we value, we call them soft skills, integrity, honesty. You know, you there's no content standards on these things, but they're important to us to teach our kids because we think they're useful skills after they leave that's what, here. That's what matters in life, right? We love our kids. I mean, They're so really cool. impressive, and they're into it, right? You can just tell. It's like they're doing things they care about. It's hydrocorn, and it's a volcanic rock. It's like what holds our plants because we can't use soil in, in a system yeah. that uses water. Wow. So our plants grow inside these buckets, yeah. and the roots grow down into the water, and like the roots suck up the water, and it goes like, through the plants and stuff. We use the leaves. We're taking data on them, yeah. and we're going to make tea to send on the Hokulea voyage. Yeah. And so, yeah. These really? Mamaki trees. How big will they get? The full-grown trees can get to five to eight feet tall. Wow. And so these are almost ready to be planted to the garden. I think schools are thinking much more deliberately about um, producing students or helping students develop a sense of purpose, a sense of passion, a um, sense that they can actually be really powerful people in their own right to make a difference in the world. When you take action around something, it makes education a lot more meaningful. And then also it impacts the community and makes things better. And to me, that's really what education is about, that there has to be some um, end result that makes and leaves the world a better place than we, than we have. Ted? Hi, Erin. How are you? Hi, great to meet you. Hi, how are you? I try to follow the rules of autonomy, mastery, and sense of purpose. So each of them had to come up with their own project, which they're going to talk to you a little bit about. My project is to develop a system that connects the EEG headset to the uh, driver's mobile phone through Bluetooth. And uh, this EEG headset can read the driver's brain signal. And whenever the drivers um, start to feel sleepy, their phone will ring and keep them awake. And this one only have five electrodes so it will be more comfortable for the drivers yeah. to wear. For my future improvement, um, I would like to um, add a motion sensor in it, uh, which I already talked about, and I need to test on more people to increase the accuracy of my uh, device. They said that we could actually um, help them with organizing the data and analyzing it. So what we did was we had um, big sheets of data from the sensors that they have up there in the yeah. dome. So the sensors and were scattered like kind of across the internet at all these different locations yeah. so and they just like weren't structured in the same way. And so we used the EMC yeah. program that they designed like specifically for this like research experiment to and centralize all the data. To plot in the data and then we centralize it into these dashboards and now we have all of them together. So we used to have just several different graphs, but we managed to put them, condense them yeah. all now. It's, it's yeah. really nice. For me, I was fortunate enough to go to New Caledonia and just Seriously? to like, yeah, to find out that this project is like international and how like there's people collaborating all over the world. It was really amazing. So they have an uh, aquarium there and yeah. we put satellite tags on loggerhead turtles, which is different than the kind of turtles we have here. So what's the species here? Green sea turtles green and hawksbill, yeah. but mostly we tag green. If you can do independent research, jump back. Yeah. Uh, we went um, to Honoka on the wet side where there are lots of cookie frogs, and uh, we collected some and took samples from them, and we did the, the um, DNA coding ourselves. Thank you. Yeah, Thank I'm you. Really excited for you. Thank you. I'll shake hands again. Thanks. Okay. Thank you so much. Like middle you. school, that's cool. To be a brew on paternal research in middle school, <laughs> doesn't get much better than that. I mean, it's really satisfying to have someone who's been to so many different schools come to our school and say it's, it's one of the best that he's seen. I mean, he, he said that in a couple of different places. Really, it's the essence of the school is this EQS plot, right? It seeks, it's the school for examining essential questions of sustainability. And really, that last block of the day is four of the five letters of our name be examining essential questions of sustainability. So in a way you can say that all the other classes, their goal is to serve that EQS block. That the idea is math is math and science is science and you know all of those things are interesting and I have passion for them myself, 
and our, our teachers have passion for them, but they're really, you learn the skills and tools of those disciplines in service of something. And we think it's in service of answering these essential questions that are facing our planet, honestly. So that's the idea behind that block, that project-based learning is by its nature interdisciplinary. And so we just wanted to honor that and say, let's make a block that's interdisciplinary. In EQS, you're able to take what things that you love to do in life, like I love poetry, I love literacy, and I was able to take that and incorporate it into my project. Our EQS questions really love me. Mm -hmm. How can human, how can species with conflicting intentions coexist with finite shared water resources? So the idea is that we examine collectively an essential question of sustainability, go on lots of field trips at the beginning, interface with a whole bunch of community experts, but then after that exposure phase, we let the students then decide what project they're interested in pursuing, and they have the content expertise of all of those teachers available to them, plus community members. I spend hours at home doing homework because I love the homework, because it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Writing poems, sure. Writing a book, sure. Like making dishes of Hawaiian culture, sure. Well, I spoke about fracking in our EQS about water sustainability and how fracking affects water, and I wrote a book about it. So it's, it's fiction. It's, fi it's it's sort of a it's fiction, but it has nonfiction uh, you know, data education. Education. Yes. Wow. Awesome. This is so cool. And then I wrote another one, but I didn't publish it, and I'm still working on my third one. His visit shows and highlights it's happening here, too. We have examples, we have models right here in Hawaii that we can all learn from. So we had a chance to meet with a lot of different kids and teachers and the principal at Waipahu. And I have to say, those kids were amazing. I mean, not just really outstanding. I mean, this was just, I was just blown away by these kids. And they had such pride in their school and in their community. I mean, they were really open in describing it as a place that a lot of people refer to as a ghetto of Hawaii. But there was something about these kids, you just said, they are going places. I think school is supposed to be an opportunity to learn about things that you can actually apply. Mm. Learn about things that will help you develop your character. Freshman year we start off with intro to engineering, so that's kind of like all of them. You learn about systems, um, design thinking process, that kind of thing. And then your sophomore year, sophomore year was my favorite year in the academy. We got 3D SolidWorks certified. So this is like a professional level yeah, certification. I love SolidWorks. Oh yeah, I love SolidWorks. Yeah. Um, so we get to learn that CAD sophomore year. Um, and then junior year, you learn ArchiCAD, different type of CAD. And um, next year, they're implementing MicroStation as another type of CAD the students will have the opportunity to use. Yeah, and you guys then, have 3D printers here? Yes. You do? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and are you an engineer? Are you actually designing and building some things? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I kind of tried to find something that I was passionate about, and it came down to writing. Yeah. yeah. And so I decided to become an English teacher. Yeah. But try find a way to incorporate art. So um, poetry, Shakespeare, yeah. all those uh, music writing, anything, playwright. So um, I'm going to be majoring in English, get my certification for secondary education, and I'm also going to minor in visual and performing arts. I want to go into the film industry. I want to write. I just want to express my thoughts. I want people to know my voice. In Waipahu, there's a stigma as Waipahu being seen as ghetto, but I think the community, it really speaks to us because it gives us all these opportunities. It helps us. For me, I'm, I, I actually have an internship to go and film something that's worthwhile. It's exciting to see because our, our students uh, are capable of many, many things, but it's up to us to provide those opportunities for them. How do we keep empowering students with new ways of thinking and new ways of doing and skills, but at the same time, <clears throat> you know, using whatever is exciting at the time to engage them, because if they're not engaged, it won't matter. What I saw is I saw these kids going through a design thinking process when they were trying to come up with ways to remember their fallen soldiers from the Vietnam War who had gone to their high school. And just watching them do that, it was about a 30 minute process but they were total experts on it. I mean, these are freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and seniors in high school, better than a lot of consultants on design thinking. 
And you're just a man, these kids are so incredible. When you think of a process uh, that brings together rigor, relevance, and, and relationships, it's design thinking for us. Um, it's, it's human centered. So you have to interact with others. You have to find out where they're coming from. You have to empathize, right? That's the first step in design thinking. I think that's huge. We had so many questions on not that we didn't know yet. So we were thinking things like, who are these soldiers? What do they look like? What did they do in high school? Were they like us? We conducted interviews within the Waipo community, which consists of the school's teachers, students, as well as the members, family, and friends. In the defined step, we were able to create a point of view statement. We defined our user POV to be, the Waipolo community needs to gain a connection with the Vietnam fallen because their stories were lost over time. So first of all, right now, we will go into ID flaring. So this is where we fire off any, any and all ideas. This will go on for three minutes. I got two, um, holiday and, or an event and a plaque, which is like one of the most obvious ones, so. <laughs> you now we will categorize our ideas. So among all the ideas you have um, come up with, you would have to categorize them, meaning you would have to find common themes. Choose the one idea that has the most votes in any color or mix, and you'll make a prototype out of it. So there's going to yeah, be a party, so and there's going to be a bench, and there's going to be a mural. Yeah. 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 Oh, can I, <laughs> so, I want to make the bench. Okay. Um, I'll make At the end, there's a, a, a sense of accomplishment for the students. They feel really good that they've helped someone. They have something that they can be proud of, that they need to present, that they need to share about. This is a tree that um, represents the eight marauders who grew up in Hawaii. And that whole process, I think, can be life-changing for students. Well, and what was great was, I mean, this is a public school in a poor area with a really committed and dedicated teaching staff, but showing what these kids are capable of because, because they were working on things they cared about and they were passionate about it and they had a chance to make their community better. And when you line those things up with kids, they will over and over again blow you away with what they're capable of doing. More and more teachers and educational leaders are realizing that learning needs to actually be relevant and learning needs to happen in some sort of context. I think many times we look at education in this, kind of in this box of like, it's in, these, it's in the grounds of a campus and things like that. And, but the opportunity is so much bigger, I think, when we look beyond the campus. I mean, learning is one of those things that happens everywhere. And it happens actually many times outside of the campus. Education can happen in many different spaces. It doesn't happen just in the classroom in the four walls, but it happens outside the community. And then also the community coming in and impacting the way that our schools teach. And so I see it very reciprocal, um, very dynamic. Um, and that there's a lot of excitement, I think, when you have these kinds of relationships. Kanehuna Moku Voyaging Academy is a nonprofit organization that is dedicating to perpetuating um, the voyaging traditions of Hawaii in our community. On the canoe, you have X amount of provisions that will last you X amount of days. And if you don't care for those resources, it could endanger people. Those things become really obvious about how important it is for us to work collaboratively, how important it is for us to perform our kuleana to the best of our abilities, how important it is for us to take care of our resources. And that's what we try to teach our students, is to how to take, bring that idea back to the island or back to our community. Grounding in place is important for us because what it does is really teaches us about um, the history of those places and how we fit into that picture as individuals and as a community, right? So um, we, we want students to uh, know their own communities first before we start to send them out into the larger community so that they themselves feel grounded um, and connected to uh, where they're from.
Values that are really specific to Hawaii, the one that always stands out to me is the idea of Olohaina. So Olohaina is um, love for the land uh, in a way that's more than stewardship. So stewardship um, describes people taking care of the land. In Hawaii, because of our lineage, because of stories like the story of Haloa, we really have what I consider a kinship with the land. The land is our older brother, our older sister, our older sibling. Um, and our relationship to the land here in Hawaii is one of reciprocity, of taking care of the land and the land taking care of us. It's not one of ownership and stewardship. Uh, that relationship is hugely powerful as a learning point for kids. It's powerful with school community partnerships. It's powerful because of Aina-based learning. Uh, and our kids have a unique opportunity to learn not only in community-based relationships, but from the land. Foster this idea of perspective taking, or critical thinking. I mean, you got to take them in different places and see education in all spaces. For our Kanehuna Moku Voyaging Academy, we we not only service the charter schools, Hawaiian-focused charter schools and emerging schools, but we are. We do also service any school that would like to come and visit us, whether it's private, public, or other charter schools. And just the fact that they are choosing Kanehunamoku as a space for learning tells me that things are changing. I think there's a lot of great things happening in Hawaii. Uh, there are schools like Wailai, like Sikhs, like Malama Onua, like Lanikai Elementary, uh, schools like uh, Hawaii Technology Academy that are doing some really innovative things. And we're at a, a juncture where we have to start working together, and we are. I'm actually very optimistic about the future of education, particularly in Hawaii. There's so many great things going on in our communities, um, which I think were featured in, in Ted's um, walkthrough. Um, and journey throughout Hawaii. Hawaii has two big opportunities. One, there are 200,000 kids more or less in schools here. And I think based on my travels, this is the most likely state in the country to make leaps ahead in terms of what they're doing for their kids. And so opportunity number one, change the lives, empower kids to move forward with the best of all prospects as young adults by being bold by doing the most innovative things and by taking advantage of all the great things that are already happening here, which are as innovative and creative as anything I've seen in 50 states. That's the first opportunity. The second, every bit as important is if Hawaii does incredible things, the rest of the country will pay attention. And so you have the ability not just to influence the future of your kids, but to have all the other states, even other countries, paying attention to what goes on here. What if we had, like, the best education system, and we can have in the country, and in the world. We can look at our communities as a canoe, and that whether I'm a teacher, or a parent, or a student, or a politician, a businessman, a lawyer, a doctor, we all have a responsibility to that canoe, just like we all have a responsibility to our communities. If all of us are willing to kind of take a piece of it and say, you know what, maybe I can be like a Keith Hayashi, but I can be me and I can do this for a school or I can do this for even for a young person. Maybe I have some a bit of wealth. Maybe I could provide some scholarships or help with whatever it is, right? If everybody did a little bit, man, we would like be done. It's multiple members coming together in all different aspects in whatever way they can to support our teachers and our students. That's, I think, the really exciting thing because then we uh, were able to leverage the collective wisdom and the collective spirit of everyone to help move public education forward. And there's just this really interesting confluence of things going on between incredible innovation in schools and a very determined but also, you know, highly collaborative society and just almost unbounded creativity here. So I think that's why the state could actually change the course of the world's education trajectory. It's an exciting time for education in Hawaii. Grounded in place and inspired by their passions, students are learning and innovating, addressing real world issues with creative problem solving. 
And as we all join together to support our schools, we will see all of Hawaii thrive. Um, I kind of scratched my head at that remark because uh, I thought that he might be a crazy man. Um, doesn't he read Civil Beat? Doesn't he read the Star Advertiser? Doesn't he know how horrible we are? Um, I'm not motivated by headlines in Civil Beat. I'm not motivated by the stories in the Star Advertiser. I'm motivated by those people in the film who are doing really remarkable things. And I think what happened while Ted was here in May is that he walked in a kind of rich, organic soil, um, albeit a curated one. I admit that. It was a very <coughs> curated visit. But it was, a, it was pretty spread out. And I think that he came to that tweet. Um, he didn't come to it lightly. And um, since then, um, I have continued to work with him. And Ted has made, uh, he's done a couple of things. Um, one, he's written a second book, so he and Tony Wagner co-authored Most Likely to Succeed, the book out of which came the documentary Most Likely to Succeed, which has been shown several thousand times across the country, and I think at least about 300 times in Hawaii, partly due to EIH, um, and partly due to the Hawaii Association of Independent Schools, and some folks out there like me who are doing community screenings. So. Um, and, and just keep in mind that he had a ginormous offer from Netflix right out of the gate to put most likely up on Netflix and he turned it down because he wanted community screenings to happen all across the country. He wanted people to be motivated to do those community screenings and that's what's happened. So two things, he's written a second book called Education Across America. He just finished it a, a couple weeks ago and um, Hawaii is a standalone <coughs> chapter. Um, and he's, he's writing about us as if we are going to be models. So that's what motivates me. That's what gets me fired up. And that's what makes me want to spend all my time outside of my job at Apple um, promoting most likely and promoting this film and doing whatever's necessary to get public, private, and charter school people talking to each other collaboratively. My, my dream is a headline in the, in the LA Times a year from now that says Hawaii, a model of public, private, and charter school, charter school collaboration and cooperation. That's my dream. Um, the other tagline for me is 100% by yesterday. It's not 55 by 25, no disrespect to that at all. It's 100% by yesterday, meaning 100% of our kids have at least an opportunity to be able to experience that kind of learning in whatever school environment they're in, public, private, or charter. So Ted made a decision to come back to what is turning out to be probably five states. But he knew right away that Hawaii was number one. He wanted to come back. And he asked me to organize this time when he comes back. And he asked me to figure out when is the appropriate moment to bring him back. And so I figured out in, in conversations with him that it would be best if he came back in February. Why? Because it positions him between EIH's conference today and the Leading Schools of the Future Conference, which is sponsored and put together by the Hawaii Association of Independent Schools, but includes public, private, and charter school uh, leadership teams coming together to roll up their sleeves, not to go to breakout sessions, but to say, here's what we're doing in our schools. Here is what we are doing in our schools, as, as Tony uh, talked about this morning. So he's coming back February 14th through um, March 1st and a couple things about that real quick. I'm super excited to tell you that after some uh, extensive talks and negotiations and conversations um, for the very first time 
um, most likely to succeed is going to air on broadcast. It will be shown statewide on PBS Hawaii on February 16th at 8 p.m. prime time. And you're gonna start to see, if you watch PBS, the trailer for most likely to show up in their prime time breaks between shows like uh, Victoria or The Crown or Nova or whatever it is that's showing. It's also gonna be the feature of their um, February publication, their monthly publication that comes out. So this is the first time that Ted's opened the door to broadcast and I'm, I'm super excited about that. We've got two weeks of insanity planned for him. Everything from um, screenings, there's gonna be a major screening at University of Hawaii. Seven UH departments have signed on as sponsors. Um, in 24 hours, we already have um, 100 RSVPs for a 300 seat capacity at the Art Auditorium. There's other multiple screenings. Um, I believe that he's going to testify in front of the Board of Education about our blueprint. So his whole point in being back here is to talk to us as a state about being public, private, and chartered together. Um, and that we know about each other, that we don't have resentments about each other, that uh, parents are fully informed about what their choices um, can be, and that we have shining examples like Waipahu and other schools where it's possible for students to go, and that the blueprint for Hawaii is really a blueprint for the state of Hawaii, not just for our public school system. So that's kind of what we're, what we're doing uh, as far as him being here. And he's coming back in April to keynote the leading schools of the future conference, and then we don't know where we go from there, but he's gonna be a friend of the state going forward. So questions, any comments? Yeah. Um, so unless our principals and our complex area superintendents respect and support teachers, we're simply going to have all of the kids whose parents care run off to the charter schools, because every year I come here, charter schools are doing great things. Most of the teachers and most of the students in the state follow scripted curriculums, pacing guides, and all they care about is that we raise test scores. In my career in this state, I've been in two of the largest complexes. I've only had one principal who trusted me and said, do it. And we did amazing things. Since then, it's been a nightmare. And so every year I come here and it makes me sad because you're talking about innovation, but the deal is not letting it happen. How do we make it happen? Um, I think that my response to that question is that we have a, a governor with a vision. We have a blueprint. I've read it really carefully. Ted has read it. He believes it's one of the most unique documents he's seen in the 50 states. And I think the answer to your question is that we all need to um, band together as a community and we need to um, get involved like I'm doing. And uh, But I, I understand what you're saying. I totally the understand. The is the one who's going to make this the strategic uh, plan is done. They're the ones who are going to make it happen and they don't have a vision. I understand. And so I think what I would echo what Tony said this morning which is that um, this moment of selecting a new superintendent is one of the most important this state has ever faced. Well, a private school and castle complex are going to fund it. I don't, I'm not hopeful that we get somebody who's an educator with vision. Wait, private school and what? Our, our search is being funded by a private company that has not been private. Yeah, yeah I understand. I SOS. I understand. <laughs> I, I, understand. I understand. I don't think, I don't think you do. Because the race at the top initiatives that we as public school teachers are forced to follow yeah. have pitted us against parents, students, and administration. Our hands are tied. We're given a workbook, and we all have to be on the same page on the same day. That is not innovative or creative. I understand. No longer do we have the luxury of interdisciplinary units. How do we, who do we speak to? How do we help? And I'm here, you have people here, but you know, no, I've been all, all to, I can tell you. I've been to the strategic plan meetings. Me too. I went to nine of them. I've been to the, read through the blueprints, okay? I've been to the DOE. We need help. You what? know, of course we can do all of these great things that we see all of these charter schools and private schools doing. But we can if we will work for it. It's not just private schools and charter schools. That's why we're I, I understand that, but not in the core contents. None of those things were English. None of those things were math. We are, our hands are tied. And those are principles who respect and care about teachers. We don't, I'm sorry, we don't have that as the norm. It's not. 
I think that's the purpose of this conference today. If you look at the schedule of conferences that have happened from um, early 2015 all the way through until today, um, it's unlike anything that's happened in any other state in the country. And I think that we're in a sweet spot. That's all I can tell you. I think we're at a moment. Yes, absolutely. As Roberta said, I think we're this close. Um, but it's going to take a lot of energy for people to put their voices into the arena and say, yes, empowerment is good, but all of those other factors that Tony talked about, about teachers being able to do R&D, that teachers have time, every one of those things, those have to be in place. And we, we need a, a Department of Education that absolutely respects that. I, I feel you. I understand your emotion. I feel it. I respect it completely, absolutely. I mean, I I concur sort of on the other side that um, and that conversation I just had with this woman over here was an, an example because I'm from a charter school. She's the principal of a of a of a um, elementary school, DOE, and I came out of this saying, "Sweet, you can do this," starting you know starting this year. In fact, our principal was here, and I walked over to him, I said, do you mind if we do, you know, and autom automatically it's there. She, on the other hand, I don't see it going through to her school at all, or going far, because she said, her comment was, this is systematic, compliance is systematic. Right. So I carried that to the governor. <coughs> I, I pulled the governor aside out over here and I said, this is the problem. You know, this is that problem. The other problem is, and I, I see the uh, head of the charter schools here, I'm grateful for, um, is that sometimes, and I'm a charter school employee, and I, I will go on to the website, state website, I will go on to look for things. And this is on the other part, is that um, the charter schools don't always get all the information and some of them are the uh, second citizens to that. There's not a good marriage. We've had many things that have put stock between us. And it also gets me frustrated as an ELL teacher, I couldn't go onto the state website and get the information because when it went to the state, to the board of it, I mean, when it went to the um, charter schools, there was no number to call. You know, so what is, that's this breakdown, and that's what we're, our frustration is. I understand, and, um, I understand. So, my, so here's, here's my comment about that. Um, I have been on my own learning walk from the very beginning since I first discovered most likely, and been very privileged with Ted's trying to continue to move forward. And I, I can tell you that never in my life, and I've been paying attention to education pretty early on, long before I began teaching. Never in my life, in my 58 years, have I seen us this close to the opportunity to come out of our foxhole, put down our weapons, and start talking to each other. And not be crabs in a bucket, not complain, but to roll up our sleeves and to say, let's take on this idea of empowerment and the age of innovation, the era of innovation, and figure out what it means and how, what teaching and learning looks like. I have never seen a moment this close. We won't get there if we spend all of our time looking backwards to things that were problems in the past. We have to move forward, and we have to start asking people to be accountable to this blueprint that says you are empowered, build a leadership team, specifically to the question of empowerment. Empowerment does not mean power. It does not mean you get power. It means you are authorized to empower the people who are around you. So the five hours that we spent on, uh, spent on Waipahu's campus with Ted um, and the continuing conversations that I've had with Keith, that's completely apparent that that's what's happened there is this trust has been developed. What's painful for you, I'm sure, is to hear about that and to say that doesn't seem to be the case where I am. It is absolutely not the case where I am, and I can't seem to get there. Right? So that's, so, but we aren't going to get there if all we do is just read those headlines and be angry about it. What we have to do is we have to pitch in and support what's happening right here with this 
blueprint and with the opportunity to get new leadership. My personal hope, I'll just go out on a limb here, I'm trying to remain in neutral territory as I go through this learning walk with most likely. My hope, and, and this speaks to your question about the search, my hope is that we find somebody who's actually done it before. Don't hire somebody who has a dream and a nice resume. Hire somebody who's done it before. I don't care where they come from. I don't care if they come from Finland or Edmonton or Singapore, maybe better that they come from Singapore, <coughs> absolutely. But let's bring somebody here who actually has done it, not somebody who just happens to be a native sister or a native son. That's just, you know, so anyway. How do you influence that choice? How do you influence the choice? Yes. Write to your board members. Is that the way? Yes, absolutely, show up and testify. That's why I've worked so hard to put Ted, Ted Dintersmith in front of the board on the 21st of February. Please come to that board meeting, surround him. He's going to speak to the blueprint vis-a-vis -vis the other 49 states. He's gonna say Hawaii is unique in the sense that it actually has that blueprint. It turns the problem of a unitary DOE into the solution. Other states have competing superintendencies and they can't talk to each other. He says California is a complete mess. Write it off, <coughs> gone. Can't even be, can't be reclaimed in any way. It's such a mess, and that was a, a surprise to me. Where is the best uh, education happening in North Dakota and Mississippi? These are states that are actually where the superintendencies are talking to each other. They all gathered together just to meet him about a month ago in, in North Dakota. So go to that board meeting. Write to your board members. Support Lance, support the other board members in this blueprint. And what that does is it puts us in a position to put pressure on the legislature to say, if we're going, to, and, and if you read the blueprint, there's one section of the blueprint that literally took my breath away. It says what he wants, what the governor wants in the blueprint, and what the, what the board is looking at is the opportunity for Hawaii to be the R&D center of the world for teaching and learning. Why not aspire to that goal? And why not have our legislature, put pressure on our legislature to fund that idea? Can you imagine what that would look like here in Honolulu? To be, to have people not going to Singapore to study the Singapore American School, to be coming here. If they came here, if somebody asked me where would I go in Hawaii, I'd say, we're on our way to Wapahu tomorrow. I wanna to show you everything that Keith is doing up there. So that's, that's my answer to that. Sorry, I'm getting kind of, okay. About the idea of being in touch with our board members, I, my heart goes out to the idea that who is going to choose our superintendent is going to be very important to yeah. what kind of superintendent we get. Mm -hmm. And as much as we want to have this vision, we can't we can't move mm -hmm. forward if we ignore those painful problems mm -hmm. where they exist right now. And we have. Uh, it's going to take courage on the part of educators to try to figure out uh, how are they going to incorporate this uh, gift of giving kids a sense of who they are and that they're important. The world needs them if they have to stick to a script. Mm -hmm. How do the teachers break away from those scripts to do that? It's going to take huge creativity on the part of our teachers. Ian uh, Kitajima was featured in the film from Oceanet made a really great point um, at some point, I think it was a panel discussion that we convened at some point at Education Institute, uh, sorry, uh, uh, the Hawaii Education Leadership Summit. Ian made a great point about how profound it is when you remove stuff rather than put stuff into place. Let's take the 61 mandates that are sitting on top of you and let's take away 60 of them and let's have one mandate but I, I'm being kind of you know hyperbolic or facetious on that. But you know, if there were four things, four learner outcomes that we were looking for, and then we were empowered to do it um, in our different communities, what a different place that would be. And I've talked to Keith about this, and he's like, "What happens here at Waipahu is going to be entirely different than what happens at Kaiser." So, because the Kaiser community is different from the Waipahu community, but if both communities start hearing those words from their kids like you heard in the film here, that those kids are literally lifting up their community and making it a better place. 
in, in that position school in the center, then we're on our way. I think we're this close. <coughs> we just have to take that step over and do it as a, as a state. Any other thoughts? I think we might be way over, I'm not sure. <coughs> anyway, thank you very much. By the way, uh, if you want to share this film, I did not turn down a ginormous offer from Netflix. <laughs> um, KelseyMatsu.com, that was there on the screen at the very end. It's available to watch anytime you want, share it with anybody, forward it out to people. Most likely to succeed in Hawaii has its own Facebook page. I uh, would love, love it if you liked it. I'm continually posting uh, inspirational examples of great stuff that's happening in the state there. And on Twitter, it's at MLTS and uh, That's my at MLTS Twitter account if you want to follow what's going on. Anyway, thank you. Thank you.